Want to speak real Spanish from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at SpanishPod101.com. Hola, soy Brenda Romagnello, tu profesora de español. Hello and welcome to another Spanish class. Today we're going to have a look at the pronunciation of consonants in Spanish. And specifically today we're going to be comparing uh, the English language and the Spanish language uh, because that, uh, and we are going to talk about the most distinctive uh, consonants, the ones that are different, yes, and they're usually the ones that cause a little bit of problem for English speakers, for example, uh, when they speak Spanish because they are different and we pronounce them differently in Spanish. All the consonants basically are pretty much the same. We use them and we say exactly the same in English and in Spanish but we are going to have a look at some that are actually different in Spanish. We're going to start with B and B. B and B. Can you see here? So it doesn't matter if it is a B or a V, yeah, how we say it in, in English. In Spanish, it will always be either B, <laughs> will always be with a soft B, a soft B. Okay, so we don't differentiate in Spanish between B and V. Okay, let's have a look at some examples. Repeat after me. Bueno. Bueno. Barato. Barato. Vela. Vela. Viernes. Viernes. So I don't know if you have noticed, but uh, when Spanish speakers uh, speak English, that's why we say sometimes very good, very, very good. <laughs> because in Spanish, we don't have very, we don't use the V as that, like that. We don't pronounce the V like that. The next one is se, se. So this is the C in Spanish. So the C will have a different sound in Spanish depending on which vowel we have after the C. So for C-A-C-O-C-U in Spanish, the C is going to turn into a K sound. Yeah, so we're going to say K-C-O-C-U. Repite. K-C-O-C-U. Por ejemplo, casa, como, cual, Okay, and if we have a CE or CI, we are going to say, uh, we are going to pronounce the C with that S sound. With an S sound. Por ejemplo, cerca, cielo. Cerca, cielo. So remember, we're going to say, ca, co, cu, se, si. And be careful if you are Italian or if you know a little bit of Italian, sometimes you, send, you tend to say cechi because that's how they, they pronounce it in, in, in Italian. So cochina, sometimes you tend to say cochina or things like that for cocina. Uh, we don't say like that. It's always se, um, like an S sound for se and si, cocina. The next one is cu, cu. So I know that we always say that we pronounce absolutely every letter in Spanish, but there is an exception. Uh, for example, when we have Q-U-E or Q-U-I in Spanish, is not gonna, we're not going to pronounce the U in between. It's not going to be cue cui. That's a mistake. Cue cui. We say instead que qui. Que qui. Por ejemplo, repite después de mí. Repeat after me. Queso. Queso, quien, quien. It's incorrect to say queso and quien. <laughs> we have to say queso, quien. The next one is je, je. So first I'm telling you what is the, 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 the letter, how we say the letter in Spanish. Je is G, but we're going to have different pronunciations depending on, again, what vowel follows this letter. So, for example, if we have G A G O G U, we're going to say that G sound. Yes, G. For example, Ga Go Gu, Ga Go Gu. Por ejemplo, Gato, 
gato, golf, golf, mucho gusto, gusto. See, so here is a g sound. But if we have GE or GI, then it's going to be like a soft H, yes? And it, actually in Spain and certain parts of, of Latin America, in certain countries, the H is a lot stronger than other countries, yes? So in this case, it will be GI, GE, uh, G -E would be G, he, 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 he. But in Spain, it's really strong. It's actually something like G, he, he, he. he. Um, uh, but remember, yes, yeah? so if we have GE or GI, it's going to be G, he. Por ejemplo, gente, gente, gimnasio, gimnasio. And the other difference is if we have the G, U, E and G, U, I, exactly the same as we were talking about the Q, U, E and Q, U, I, we're not going to pronounce that U in between. We're going to say G, G. Yeah? So this is so that we know how to pronounce, how to say G, G in Spanish, because we know how to say Ga, Go, Gu, but then how do you say G, G if you say G, I and G, E is G, G. Well, you put a U in between, and that's how we say ge, gi. Remember, it's not going to be gue, gui. So we are going to say, por ejemplo, guerra, guerra, guitarra, guitarra. The next one is la J, la J. That's how we say J in Spanish, J, la J. So la J, it always has the very strong H sound. It's a, it's a little bit stronger than the H in Spanish. That's why I think Spanish speakers, when we speak English, we say house and how are you, no? <laughs> because for us, the H is very strong. It's a lot stronger. There's a, a lot more um, air going through your throat when, when you say a G-I-G-E and a, and a J, no, a J. So all the Jotas, all the vowels after a J will be uh, with a H sound. Por ejemplo, Japón, Japón. The next one is la H, the H. So I'm not sure if you have noticed this, but in Spanish, the H, basically we write it in some words, but it's never pronounced. The H in Spanish is silent. So. Be careful with this one because if you are an English uh, speaker, you tend to like pronounce it as a house or how are you and um, with a H sound. In Spanish, pretend is not there, okay? So we don't say hola, we say hola. We don't say hermano, we say hermano, okay? And sometimes it could be in the middle of a word. Por ejemplo, zanahoria for carrot, zanahoria. So you can see it's in the middle of the word, but it's like it doesn't exist. So we only have to write it in Spanish. The only exception is, of course, if we have a CH, CH, CH. So if you have the C and the H together, it's the same as in English, it has a CH sound. Ch. Por ejemplo, repeat after me, Chao, Chao, China. China. In this case, it will affect the, the pronunciation of a CH. You need to pronounce the H after a C. The next one is the double L. See, double L, double L. Double L. There are many different ways to pronounce the double L in Spanish, yes, um, and there are different ways depending on what country uh, you are, but mostly. Um, for example, where I'm from in Argentina, we have what we call Jismo, yes, which is basically to pronounce the double L and the Y exactly the same. And it's something like depending on actually within Argentina, there are many different um, accents, yes, within one, one single country. And for example, in Buenos Aires, where you have the porteño accent, it's more of a sh sound. So we are going to say me llamo. Yes, me llamo for I am cold, me llamo or lluvia, see, ¿sí? lluvia. Uh, but where I'm from, from Cordoba, we have more of a, um, a softer 
uh, G, J, like that, and we say Juvia, Juvia, or Me llamo, Me llamo. But it depends in, in what country, in which Spanish country you are in, how they will pronounce the double L. So which variation should you choose? Well, it depends on your preference. Uh, for example, if you have a preference for, or you know someone, or you wish to travel to Mexico, or if you prefer Colombia, or Spain, España, Argentina, depending on what your preference is, maybe you want to pick that specific variation of um, the culture or country that you, you prefer the most. If not, maybe go with a general J, G. <laughs> yes, yeah, so me llamo o me llamo. The next one is ñ, la ñ. La ñ is very distinctive of the Spanish language and it will be similar to that ñ, that ing sound that we have in English. Por ejemplo, mañana, mañana, baño, baño. Okay, uh, it's very important that you pronounce it. The next one, which we have already sort of touched upon, is uh, Y, yes? La Y, Y, which literally means the Greek I in Spanish. And like I was saying, for example, in, Span in Argentina, where I'm from, it's very common uh, in, in Buenos Aires to say yo, yes, or yerba for, um, you know, the specific um, Argentinian tea that we drink is called yerba and it has a Y, a Y, so that's why we say yerba. But I am from Cordoba and I think the Cordoba accent is a little bit more like a normal or neutral. Uh, they also use it like that in, in Colombia and other uh, parts of Latin America and it's more like yerba or yo. Yes, but it also, some people pronounce it as yo or yerba. The next one is, I'm sure your friend, if you have met before, if not, let me introduce you to la R or R. Yes, R or R. So this is the R. Okay, and this letter gives a little bit of a headache to most Spanish students because it's trilled. Yes, we have that trill sound. And if you think about it, it sounds like a Scottish R. So if you, want, if you want to think about a Scottish person, maybe um, you can see the, the, the R, how it's, it's done in Spanish. But um, it's not always trilled, okay? I'll show you how to trill it in a second. Um, so what you have to do is you, put a, you have to open your mouth. Yeah, it, the sound doesn't come through, uh, from your throat, it comes from your mouth, yes? From the tongue moving against the palate at the top and that's what pronounces the sound, not from a guttural or a, you know, like a throat uh, sound, as for example in French or other languages. Uh, okay, I'm, I don't speak French, so I'm just guessing that's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's have a look at this one, yes? R. Look, if I stop my, my tongue for a bit, I just, the sound doesn't come out. So you need to let the, the tongue be really soft, like tilt it against the palate like this and let the air flow and do this motion against the palate. That's what creates the R. It's kind of like a purring, like a car, a cat. Okay, okay, so it's important that you try it because sometimes you will change the meaning of a word and you will sound very natural if you actually even try to do it, even if you think that you can't pronounce it, okay? So let's have a look when it's real and when it's not. It's not trilled, sorry, it is trilled, let's start with the trilled, uh, at the beginning of a word. For example, rápido, rápido, okay? Fast, rápido. And it's also trilled when you have it in a double R, doble R or doble R, okay? Por ejemplo, perro, perro, o carro, carro. You see, you have that double R in the middle of a word. But it's not trilled if it is uh, only one R in the middle of a word, for example, pero, pero, caro, caro. 
and it's not trill when it's at the end of a word. For example, amor, comer. Amor, comer. Okay? So if it is at the end of the word, not trilled. If it's only one R in the middle, not trilled. If it is one R at the beginning, trilled. Two double R's, two R's uh, in the middle, trilled. Okay? Uh, and look how important it is to pr try to, pr at least try to pronounce it because you're either saying dog or bad, yeah? Perro, pero, or you're saying car or, or, or expensive, yes? Carro, e uh, expensive. Carro o caro, yes, expensive. So it is important, um, of course the context will help you get your message across, but it's, uh, you will save the, the, the Spanish speaker time of trying to figure out what you're trying to say, if you just say it perfectly fine. It will be way easier for you to be understood. So even if you try, and I know it's, it's frustrating sometimes, even if you go perro, perro, uh, Perro, right? If you try to make the emphasis, try to make an effort, it will still sound like you're trying to say dog and not uh, however. And the last one is zeta. Zeta. The Z. Zeta. So, the Z in Spanish in Latin America, it sounds like an S. Yes, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure if you have noticed this, but for example, in Latin America, for shoe, we say zapato. Zapato. Okay, zapato. But in Spain, they they have it, they pronounce it differently, and then the Z will be pronounced by putting your tongue in between uh, your teeth, and it will sound something like, I'm not from Spain, so obviously, please give me, cut me some slack here, <laughs> but it's something like zapato, 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 okay? Uh, I know that they pronounce it as well when there is a C in the middle of a word, um, but that's a, that's a different, it's, it's not related to the Z here, yes? But that is the difference between the Z between Latin America and Spain. All right, just to summarize, let's just practice all the pronunciation of some words that we have learned. Repeat after me. Repite después de mí. Casa. Vela. Barato. Como. Cerca. Cielo, queso, quién, gato, golf, gusto, gente, gimnasio, guerra, guitarra, hola, hermana, me llamo, mañana, yo, Rápido, perro, pero, caro, comer, zapato. Muy bien, muchísimas gracias por ver la clase. Thank you very much for watching today's lesson and I will see you next class. Adiós. Hola, soy Brenda Romanielo, tu profesora de español. Hello and welcome to another Spanish class. Today we're going to um, have a, a, a class for beginners and we're going to learn how to say the days of the week in Spanish. We are going to start with the days of the week in Spanish and how we say the days of the week in Spanish. We say los días de la semana. Los días de la semana. So, días significa days y semana significa week, ¿ok? So, we're going to have a look at los días de la semana. Repite después de mí. So, repeat after me. Lunes. 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 That's for Monday. Martes. 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 That's Tuesday. Miércoles. 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 I want you to pay attention that miércoles has that little written accent in the E 
So that indicates to you where the stress of the word goes. So whenever you see that written accent, that is where it's telling you that you need to put the stress, the emphasis of the word in that specific syllable. So it's not miércoles, yes, it's miércoles, miércoles. That's Wednesday, right? Jueves, jueves. Jueves, Thursday, viernes, 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 Friday. Okay, you might be asking and wondering, you have a V for viernes, right? La V, but I'm saying it as a soft B, as if it was actually with a B instead of a V. Okay, that's because the, the B and the V in Spanish, they are exactly the same and they are both this very soft, you only put your lips together and there's a very tiny little air flow uh, going through it to pronounce exactly the same. So we basically pronounce B and V exactly the same as B, okay? So it's not viernes. Um, it could be the case, for example, if you are spelling the word or if you say it very slowly, then it will very likely be uh, viernes. But Spanish speakers, when we say it naturally and in, in, a, in a conversation or just in speech, it will be very fast and very soft. It will be viernes. Viernes. Okay, so now let's move on to el fin de semana. El fin de semana. Fin, ¿sabes qué significa? Do you know what fin means? I'm not sure if you've seen it maybe in movies or uh, something like that where at the end they have it el fin, the end. So fin significa end, okay? And fin de semana significa it means the weekend or the end of the week. Yes, it literally means the end of the week. In English we say the weekend, el fin de semana. So, el fin de semana, we're gonna have, repite después de mí, repeat after me, sábado, sábado, sábado y domingo, domingo, domingo. Muy bien. Vamos a repetir. Repite después de mí. Let's review this, how to say the days of the week in Spanish. Lunes. Martes. Miércoles. Jueves. Viernes. Sábado. Domingo. The days of the week in Spanish are inspired by uh, the planets and the universe. So this started in the ancient, in ancient Rome. And so at that time, there were only the moon, the sun, and a few planets that were known to the world. And that's where the days of the week uh, came from. The names of the, na of the days of the week are actually coming from the Latin uh, root. And they're inspired by the planets. Because at the time, uh, we, the, we used to have a sense of the days based on the moon and the, and the months uh, of the year, also based on the phases of the moon and etc. So it's really interesting. So we can see here that Monday is inspired by the, the moon, Luna. Martes is from the planet, Marte. Uh, miércoles is coming from Mercurio. Jueves from Júpiter. Viernes from Venus. Sábado from Saturn or Saturno. Y domingo from the sun. And as you can see in other, can in other languages like English, um, Saturday and Sunday, they are inspired by Saturn and um, the sun. But what happened is that in Spanish, only the first uh, five days of the week remain um, this, the, retain this origin from the Latin language and from the planets. But um, with the race of religion, eventually Saturday uh, was inspired more by Sabbat, yes, from the Jewish uh, religion, which means uh, basically the day to rest, see, ¿sí? día de descanso, and domingo, 
was named after the day of um, the, the Lord, yes, el, el Día del Señor, uh, which was uh, based on the resurrection of Jesus. So that's why now Saturday and Sunday in Spanish is Sábado, uh, from Sabbath y Domingo, from the day of the Lord. Um, so those two changed, but uh, as you can see in other countries, they still uh, retain that origin from the planets. Okay. So now I want you to practice in the comments below. Tell me, ¿Qué día es hoy? What day is it today? Yes, what day is it today? Hoy significa today. So hoy means today. And the answer, yes, that you can use to comment and to, to write a, a reply or an answer for this question is hoy es, and then insert there the day of the week. Por ejemplo, hoy es lunes, hoy es viernes, hoy es domingo. Muy bien. Let me know in the comments what day of the week it is today for you. I hope you enjoyed the lesson and I will see you in the next one. Adiós, hasta luego. Hola, soy Brenda Romaniello, tu profesora de español. Bienvenidos a tu clase. Welcome to your Spanish class. My name is Brenda Romaniello and today I'm going to teach you the genitive case in Spanish, how it works and how to form it in Spanish. So what is the genitive case to start with? It's when in English, for example, we'd say this is Anna's book or Anna's house, Anna's mother, Anna's sister. That is the genitive case. When we establish belonging, yes, or um, when we establish the relationship between people and things, uh, in, in English, we're going to have that apostrophe, yes, after the person uh, that is uh, possessing, yes, or that we want to establish the possession relationship with. And then you have the apostrophe, the S, and there are, of course, other rules. And then we'll, we'll have whatever this person is um, possessing or the relation that we want to establish, yes, Anna's house. What we want to say here is that the house is Anna's, yes, Anna owns the house or the house is hers. Okay, so we are going to learn how to do this uh, relationship, how it works, the genitive case in Spanish. There are two ways to show ownership or personal or family relationships in Spanish. We can say, number one, Marta es la madre de Ana. Yes, we can say Marta is Ana's mother. Or we can also say Marta es su madre. Yes, Marta es su madre. So Marta is her mother. On the second example, the family relationship is given by the possessive adjective su, which in this case means her. So we're going to have a look at the different possessive adjectives, yes, in the case of Marta es su madre, si Marta is her mother, we're going to learn the different possessive adjectives in Spanish. To say my in Spanish, yeah, it's not correct to say de mi, of me. It doesn't make sense in Spanish. It doesn't work like that. We'll have a look at that later. But to say my in Spanish, el adjetivo posesivo singular would be me. Me and plural would be mis. We'll talk about this in a minute to give you extra information on how to use these possessive adjectives. For your informal, we are going to say tú and the plural tus. We don't say de ti. Don't worry, we'll talk about this in a minute. If you want to say your formal, yes, if you want to establish that relationship, then we have to say de usted, yes, of you formal, de él o de ella, yes, so of him or of her. We'll talk about this in a minute. But if you want to use the possessive adjective, if you want to say her or his, then we say su. So su significa your formal, his and her. And sus is the, plur the plural form, so it will also mean your formal, his and her. To say our in Spanish, you can say de nosotros, de nosotras, ¿sí? of us, yes, of we, we would say the literal translation is, and the possessive adjective for our would be nuestro or nuestra, and the plural form is nuestros, nuestras. Your for vosotros, would be de vosotros, de vosotras, 
and the possessive adjective will be vuestro, vuestra for the singular and vuestros, vuestras for the plural. Don't worry, we'll have a look at some examples. Your uh, meaning from you all in Latin America, remember ustedes means you all in Latin America and vosotros means you all in Spain. So we can say de ustedes, of you all, and the possessive adjective will be su and sus, singular and plural. And their will also be the ellos, the ellas, see, of them, or the possessive adjective will also be the same as ustedes, su and sus. So in Spanish, we don't have the genitive case to establish belonging or possessions. We have to say the whole phrase using the, which means of. So in, in Spanish, we don't say uh, my uncle's son like that. We just have to say the son of my uncle. So in Spanish, we would say el hijo de mi tío, the son of my uncle, el hijo de mi tío. O Anna's house, we would have to say the house of Anna. We have to say la casa de Anna, la casa de Anna, the house of Anna. I know this is something different that we need to get used to, but if you want to do that relationship, establish that relationship of possession in Spanish, just think about the whole phrase. How would you say that in English, the weird way, yes? So the, the house of Anna or the uncle of, the son of my uncle, yes? And then you'll be able to do it and translate it into Spanish. There are some other things that we need to pay attention to. Number one is that yo and tú cambian, so they change. Uh, they are irregular after the preposition de. So if we have de plus yo, we say de mi. Okay, we don't say de yo, it's incorrect. And de tu becomes de ti, not de tu. Okay, that's also incorrect. They're irregular, we have to change them. Uh, now, the only thing is de mi and de ti are not used for possessions. So de mi and de ti are not used for possessions, like we were looking at the previous table before, we say de mi and de ti, doesn't make sense for possessions, we have to say mi, mis or tu and tus. Something important to talk about the possessive adjectives in Spanish is that they are going to match what we are possessing, they are going to match in gender and in number what we are possessing and not the person possessing, okay? Not the relationship establishing by the person that, that owns or belongs to something. Okay, so let's have a look at this example. La madre de nosotros, la madre de nosotros, so here madre es femenino singular, so we have to say our, and remember we have four different options. We can say nuestro, nuestra, nuestros, nuestras. Which one would you pick for our? Remember, we're not going to match nosotros, we, okay? We're not going to say nuestros madres, okay? Nuestros madres is incorrect because here we're matching the mother, what we own, what we have the relationship with. So we have to say nuestra madre because madre is femenino and singular. Can you see this here? If we were now talking about our father, yes, el padre de nosotros, see, the father of us, <laughs> el padre de nosotros, as you can see, we, the possessive, the possessive people, yeah, the people that are possessing or the relationship is the same, we, we're talking about we and our father. But now we changed from madre to padre. Now padre is masculino and singular. Therefore, we need to say our father is nuestro padre. Okay, is that, does that make sense? Remember, we have to match what we own, not the person owning the thing or the person. Vamos a practicar, let's practice. I want you to complete the following sentences with the correct possessive adjective. So remember, in between brackets, you're gonna have the relationship of him, of her, of us, etc. And I want you to use me, tu, su, etc., etc. Respuestas. Ellos son sus primos. Ellos son sus primos. So remember, here sus is the, the plural because we are saying, we are matching it with primos. 
see there um, his cousins the cousins is a uh, plural and is uh, his we want to say his so we have to say sus yo soy su hija yo soy su hija número tres ella es nuestra abuela vuestra madre tiene 56 años the next one tu novio es de portugal su esposa es abogada ella es muy inteligente the next one nuestras tías son amables y buenas nuestras tías mi suegra no es amable mi suegra de vosotros the next one is vuestros padres tienen los ojos marrones I hope you were able to use the correct possessive adjectives in these cases and remember we're matching what we're possessing in this case now let's do this exercise you have to rewrite the following genitive cases in English into Spanish like the example so for example Melissa's apple we are going to say remember if you have to think about it how we say it in English the long way would be the apple of Melissa so in Spanish would be la manzana de Melissa respuestas Juan's keys, we're going to say las llaves de Juan. Ana's book, el libro de Ana. Pedro's dog, el perro de Pedro. Laura's car is going to be el coche carro de Laura. Roberto's house is going to be la casa de Roberto. Mario and Julio's cat, el gato de Mario y Julio. Daniela's plate, el plato de Daniela. Karina's friend is el amigo o la amiga de Karina. Julia's bed is la cama de Julia. Manuel's brother is el hermano de Manuel. Christian's father is el padre de Christian. Y Luis's mother is la madre de Luis. Okay, so remember we don't have the genitive case per se like that in English. We have to say the whole entire phrase to establish the belonging. Ana's house, la casa de Ana. Ana's mother, la mamá o la madre de Ana. I really hope that you enjoyed today's lesson. Thank you so much for watching. Y nos vemos en la próxima clase. I will see you next class. Adiós. Hola, soy Brenda Romaniello, tu profesora de español. Hello, this is Brenda Romaniello, your Spanish teacher. Today we're going to learn how to form the singular and plural forms of the nouns, yes, los sustantivos en español, in Spanish. So the same as in English, when we have only one thing or one person, we're going to say that that's a singular thing, singular. So we call this número en español, see, ¿sí? number. When we want to talk about número, number in Spanish, we make reference if we are talking about one thing, yes, singular, or if we're talking about two or more things, plural, okay? So certain things, yes, uh, will have a plural form and a singular form. So when we talk about the singular form, el singular, in that case will be one thing of that thing and if we talk about the plural form of it then we are going to be referring to two or more things por ejemplo mesa es singular yeah it's singular we're just saying here table and the plural form of mesa would be mesas okay and the same for example if we say that we're talking about árbol el singular árbol si that's a tree and el plural de árbol would be árboles, árboles, okay? So that's the plural, we, we're talking about two or more trees and then two or more tables. So how do we form the plural? Let's have a look at this table. So if the word ends in a vowel, una, una vocal en español, if the word ends in a vowel, then we're going to add an S an S at the end, okay? So, like we said before, mesa will become mesas, libro will become libros, 
silla will become sillas, puerta will become puertas, calle will become calles, puente will become puentes, oso will become osos, coche will become coches, etc. And if the word, yes, if the sustantivos, if the noun ends in a consonante, in a consonant, then we're going to add e, s after at the end to make this a plural form. Okay, so let's have a look at some examples. Sillón is going to become sillones. Televisión is going to become televisiones. Color is going to become colores. Tenedor, tenedores. Lombriz, lombrices. Nuez, nueces. Okay, so I want you to pay attention to the last two. As you can see, they ended in Z and Z, but when we put it in the plural form, we are going to transform that Z and it's going to become a C in the plural form. Okay, so whenever you have a Z in the singular form, in the plural, we're going to change that Z for a C. And then we're going to add ES at the end to form the plural. There's something else that we need to pay attention to in Spanish. So let's have a look at this phrase here. If I say gato, muy bien, gato means cat, so that's our sustantivo, our noun. noun. Now let's say that I want to say that this, this is the cat, yes? So we're going to say the cat, we're going to say in Spanish el gato, muy bien, el gato. But then say that I want to say that this is a black cat in Spanish, the black cat, right? So we're going to say el gato negro, okay? So el gato negro, remember we're going to have the adjectives after uh, what we're describing in Spanish, that's a difference in word order in Spanish. And now let's say that I want to talk about cats as in plural, yes? We're talking about two or more cats. How are we going to transform this sentence? Well, we're going to start with gato, yes, we're going to put it in the plural and we're going to say gatos, okay, gatos. But here is, it doesn't work like in English, in English you can say the black cats and then it makes all that plural, yes, the black and the the. In Spanish we have to basically select the plural and the masculine form of each and specific uh, parts of this sentence. The article, yes, so the, the noun, yes, cat, and then also the adjective, in this case, black. So we're going to have to say los gatos negros, okay? Los gatos negros. Muy bien. Okay, so what happens, for example, if I have gata? Now, the gata is a female cat, yes? So, gata. How are we going to form, uh, how are we going to say the female cat? We're going to say la gata. La gata, the female cat, okay? And what if this female cat is also black? How are we going to say that? La gata negra. Okay, and then if I want to say that we're talking about two or more cats, how would, do we transform that in the plural form? We would say las gatas negras. As you can see, this is um, very important in Spanish. We basically have agreement in the entire sentence. Everything has to be feminine or masculine, yes, or masculino or femenino, everything has to be singular or plural. Todo tiene que ser singular o plural. Yes, we have to match absolutely everything in a sentence in Spanish. Vamos a practicar. Now, I want you to tell me cómo se dice en español. How do you say this in Spanish? You can pause the video to think of your answer and when you're ready, just resume the video. Respuestas. Se dice mesa, silla, mesero, copa, vaso, taza de café, botella, servilleta, plato, tenedor, cuchara, cuchillo. Now, I want you to tell me how do we form the plural of all these things.
Respuesta, platos, tazas, tenedores, meseros, cuchillos, mesas, vasos, sillas, botellas, servilletas, copas, cucharas. Muy bien, muy buen trabajo. Good job. Now let's do this exercise. You have to transform these words into their plural form. Are you ready? Let's do it. So take a few minutes to think about the answer and when you're ready, continue the video. Respuesta. Escritorio, escritorios. Vaso, vasos. Lámpara, lámparas. Almohadón, almohadones. Corazón, corazones. Sol, soles. Radiador, radiadores. Colchón, colchones. Muy bien, muy buen trabajo. So that is all for today. Muchas gracias por ver la clase y nos vemos en la próxima. Thank you so much for watching this class and I will see you in the next one. Adiós. Hola, soy Brenda Romaniello. Welcome to your Spanish class. My name is Brenda Romaniello and today I'm going to show you how to spell words in Spanish. In order to spell words in Spanish, we need to learn the, um, the alphabet in Spanish, yes? Because we're going to learn how to say each letter of the alphabet in Spanish to be able to spell words. So let's have a look at the alphabet in Spanish. We have uh, 27 letters, so let's have a look at what they are. Some of these letters have two ways, two, two names for these letters. So I'm going to show you the different names that some letters may have in Spanish as well. A, B. So for the letter B in Spanish, which is always pronounced as a B, a soft B, uh, we have two names. We can call it B o B larga. See, in certain uh, countries we call it B, and some other countries, for example, in Argentina, we say B larga. C. C. D. D. E. E. F. F. G. G. So the letter G in Spanish, we pronounce it like a, like a stronger H, yes? Yeah? So we're going to say G, G, muy bien. H, H. Remember that the H is silent in Spanish, so that includes to, uh, the name of this letter. So we say H, just pretend the H is not there. E, E. Cuidado, just be careful, don't get it confused when uh, with the English I, yes, we never say I in Spanish, this letter is called E and it's always pronounced E in Spanish as well. J, J, K, K, L, L, M, M, N, N, Ñ, Ñ, O, O, P, P, Q, Q, R, R, Something to note is that some countries, uh, for example in Colombia, they like to call R as R. S, S, T, T, U, U, V, V, O, V corta, V corta, W, 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 B, 
W, X, X, Y, Y, O, Y, Y, Z, Z. <coughs> so notice that when I was saying the B and the V or B corta, um, when you spell, yes, when we spell in Spanish and we make every single letter important, we'll make a distinction between B or B larga y V y V corta, yes, because we want to tell the person that is, when we are spelling, that is either the B larga or B corta, no? B corta. But as you can see, when, when we say words in Spanish with B or V, uh, they are the same. They are a very soft B, okay? So most likely, most Spanish speakers, they don't make the distinction even when we spell a word, okay? So it could be B, B larga, V, V corta, or V, V corta. The following letters are not part of the alphabet, but they have specific names that it's important to point them out. The first one is the CH, CH o CH, CH o CH. The next one is EG, EG o doble L, doble L. And the last one, R. R o doble R. I did mention before that in some in some countries uh, they do say only one R as R as well. Whenever you are spelling a word and it has that little uh, that written accent at the top, in that case we have to say con tilde. So, for example, if you want to spell Mexico, then you would say that we spell M E con tilde X I -E C O Mexico. O fácil, we say that we spell F A con tilde C I L. Fácil. All right, let's practice again, but this time I want to show you a pronunciation guide in English so that you have a better idea of how, on how the alphabet, all these letters in Spanish, are pronounced. Let's have a look at that. Repite después de mí. Repeat after me. A, B, C, Ch, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, L, M, N, Ñ, O, P, Q, R, R, S, T, U, B, W, X, Y, O, Y, Z. There are two questions that we can ask uh, for the spelling of a word in Spanish. We can ask, ¿Cómo se deletrea? Or, ¿Cómo se escribe? Por ejemplo, ¿Cómo se deletrea libro? How do you spell book? ¿Cómo se deletrea libro? ¿Cómo se escribe libro? How do you write libro? Yes, book. ¿Cómo se escribe libro? And then we have the different answers. So for the first question, ¿Cómo se deletrea? We are going to say, se deletrea L y B larga R O libro. And for the second option we'll say se escribe L I B larga R O libro. ¿Cómo se deletrea? Vamos a practicar. Let's practice. Tell me how we spell in Spanish the following words. I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about it and then when you're ready you can continue the video to see the answers.
Respuestas. Baño se escribe o se deletrea B, A, N, O. Baño. Cerveza se escribe o se deletrea C, E, R, B corta, E, Z, A. Vino se deletrea B corta, I, N, O. Siesta se deletrea S, I, E, S, T, A. Amigo se deletrea A, M, I, G, O. Queso se deletrea Q, U, E, S, O. Cuba se deletrea C, U, B, A. Helado se deletrea H, E, L, A, D, O. Canguro se deletrea C, A, N, G, U, R, O. Whisky se deletrea W, O, W, H, I, S, K, Y, O, Y. Apellido se deletrea A, P, E, W, L, I, D, O. Jabón se deletrea J, A, B, O, B, larga, O, con acento, N. Perro se deletrea P, E, W, R, O, W, R, O, R, O. Abocado se deletrea A, B, corta, O, V, O, C, A, D, O. Elefante se deletrea E, L, E, F, A, N, T, E. Y lluvia se deletrea W, L, U, V, corta, O, V, I, A. Now I'm going to spell some words for you. Yes, there's going to be three words that I'm going to spell and see if you can understand them and see if you can put them together. Grab a piece of paper and a pen and then um, let's see if you can understand the spelling of these words. Number one, the first one. M E S A. M E S A. Number two. C O C H E C O C H E And the last one which is going to be a little bit harder so pay attention is A L M O H A V A A L M O, H, A, V, A. Could you guess what word it is? Let's have a look. So the first one was M, E, S, A. That's mesa. M, E, S, A. The second word was coche. C, O, C, H, E. And the last one, A, L, M, O, H, A, D, A. Almohada. See, ¿sí? that's pillow. Fantástico. ¿Cómo se deletrea tu nombre y tu apellido? How do you spell your name and your last name? Por ejemplo, mi nombre se deletrea B larga R E N D A. Brenda. Y mi apellido se deletrea R O M, A, N, I, doble L, O. Romanielo. Muy bien, that's all for today. Thank you so much for watching. And in the comments below, I would like you to spell your name. Okay, so you don't need to put your last name if you don't want to, but your name, tu nombre. Cómo se escribe, cómo se deletrea, 
tu nombre. Por ejemplo, mi nombre se escribe B larga R E N D A. Okay? Let's practice in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next class. Nos vemos en la próxima clase. Adiós. Hola, soy Brenda Romaniello, tu profesora de español. Welcome to your Spanish class. My name is Brenda Romaniello and today I'm going to share with you some important cultural tips about Latin America, which is spare change. Let's start the lesson with some vocabulary about money and the different words that you can use to use for money in Spanish. Repite después de mí. So repeat after me. Efectivo. Efectivo. Efectivo significa cash. Dinero. Dinero. Dinero significa money. Billetes. Billetes. Notes. Monedas. Monedas. Coins. Vuelto. Vueltas. Vuelto. Vueltas. Change. Cambio is also change. Cambio. Centavos, centavos, cents, and this is for pesos. Centimos, centimos is the cents for euros. Tarjeta de crédito, tarjeta de crédito, credit card. Tarjeta de débito, tarjeta de débito, a debit card. Y casa de cambio, casa de cambio is currency exchange or money exchange store. So, a common phrase that you will hear when you pay, if you go to a store in Latin America and you give them a big bill for something that you're paying that doesn't cost as much, as much money would be, lo siento, no tengo cambio, I'm sorry, I don't have change. And this is common when you go shopping in Latin America and uh, you pay for something that is perhaps not as um, expensive, if you pay with big notes or big bills, you will notice that um, small change is really hard to come by. Uh, certain stores, supermarkets, and, and different retailers don't have spare change. And so my recommendation for you is to always have small change in your pocket, have small change with you. Just don't take big notes or a lot of money when you go out and about in your trip, if you're traveling or you're visiting, or if you live there, because more likely the person, uh, the, the shop assistant, won't be able to give you the change that you need for uh, the item that you want to purchase. So most likely they will say that to you, to you, lo siento, no tengo cambio, and of course you may choose not to buy whatever you decided you want to buy, but in some cases if it is an emergency or you really need or want that, that thing, that item, you might have to just pay with that big bill and just not take change, don't keep the change or, or just go without having any change in return. So if, if that's the case, what I want you to bear in mind is that you should have some spare change with you. Uh, so when you go to the Casa de Cambio, see the money exchange store, perhaps ask them to give you small change so that you have extra. Or if you go to a store and you buy something and they give you a big note uh, as part of the change, you can say, oh, can you break that change for me, yes? Me das cambio? Puedes darme cambio? Si, sí, can you give me some smaller change, yes? And that includes monedas, eh, billetes, si, sí, o um, centavos, etc. So that includes coins and notes. You might be also thinking, well, I just pay with my debit card or my credit card. Uh, just bear in mind that a, a lot of places, depending on where you go, of course, big cities and nowadays the, it's more common to be um, to have access to paying with credit card, but it is not uh, entirely the case all over the place, um, especially if you're traveling around Latin America and you go to more rural areas, bear in mind that they may not have the, uh, the, the option uh, to pay with a tarjeta de crédito, with a, with a credit card. 
the other suggestion that I want to tell you about is to take not all your money with you of course just take what you think you'll be using for the day with different coins and, and bills and notes of different amounts so that you are able to really buy anything that you want or you need for that day and if that is the case that you get pickpocketed or if you lose it or if it falls out of your pocket or if you just misplace the money then it doesn't ruin your entire holidays because you still have more money or more change uh, back in your hotel or hostel um, and it's not a big deal if you lose the money for, for that day. Perhaps if you want to ask how much something costs you can say cuánto cuesta yes cuánto cuesta and then if you want to make sure that they will have change it would say tienes cambio de and then whatever amount of money you have so for example let's say that you have 100 pesos 100 pesos you can say tienes cambio de 100 tienes cambio de 50 tienes cambio de 1000 see do you have change for 100 do you have change for 50 and so you ask that question before uh, you try to to pay for your item. So the difference between cambio and vuelto, they're similar, yes, they're similar, but vuelto is what people, what, when you pay something and they give you money back, yes, so that's what they return money back to you, yes, so the money that, that you have. And cambio is if they can change, yes, cambio significa change, in the sense of uh, if you can break down that amount. Yes, yeah, so it, they are used as synonyms in certain um, contexts. Yes, yeah, so for example, if you buy something from me and I, I can tell you, aquí tienes el vuelto, here is your change. Yes, el vuelto, whatever I have to return back to you from the transaction, or I can say, aquí tienes el cambio. If you want me to keep the change, yes, uh, I would. you would say, quédate con el cambio. Muy bien, I really hope that you remember this tip when you go on, on your next trip to Latin America and that you do have change with you, que te, tienes cambio contigo to be able to enjoy your holidays to the fullest. Muchísimas gracias, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next class. Adios. Want to speak real Spanish from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at SpanishPod101.com. Hola amigos de SpanishPod101.com. Yo soy Efraín. Y yo soy Diego. And today we have 10 ways to disagree and at the end we have a skit. So don't, uh, don't miss the end of this video because it is pretty interesting. So enjoy this video. Wow! Okay guys, so we have previously recorded a video talking about 10 ways to agree in Spanish but what happens when you don't truly agree with what the other person says? Uh, well, in that case you need to know how to disagree in Spanish and we're going to show you 10 ways for doing so. Don't forget that at the end we're going to record a skit so you can uh, see how it works in an authentic example. So why don't we start with the first one, Efraín? Yeah, the first one is no estoy de acuerdo or it's equal estoy en desacuerdo mm -hmm. which is I disagree no estoy de acuerdo or estoy en desacuerdo yeah for example Bruno Mars es el rey del pop estoy en desacuerdo ese es Michael Jackson the next one is the structure como que plus the information that you disagree with. Once again, como, que, plus the information that you disagree with. And in English, um, it's kind of, how can you say that? For example, siempre estudio para los exámenes. ¿Qué? ¿Cómo que siempre estudias para tus exámenes si en el examen pasado yo te di todas las respuestas? No es cierto, solo me diste 10. El examen tenía 10. <laughs> okay, so the next one is no es cierto. It is not true. No es cierto. Mm -hmm. Exactly. For example, yo tengo una tarántula como mascota. <laughs> no es cierto. A ti te dan miedo las arañas. Yeah, that's true. The next one is no es la verdad, which is very similar to the previous one. And it means it isn't true. No es la verdad. For example, 
me gustan mucho las víboras. No es la verdad, uh -huh. tú odias las víboras. Ey, mi novia, mi futura novia está viendo esto y a ella le gustan las víboras. Ah, sí, te encantan las víboras. <risa> The next one is, no te creo nada. I don't believe you anything. No te creo nada. Yeah. Por ejemplo, gané un torneo internacional de ajedrez. No te creo nada. Apenas sabes mover un peón. ¿Qué es un peón? <risa> The next one is, eso no tiene sentido. Eso no tiene sentido. That doesn't make sense. Por ejemplo, yo canto muy bien. Eso no tiene sentido, Efraín. Claro que sí. <risa> The next one is um, another way to disagree, but this is a formal uh, word, okay? Which is yo en eso discrepo or yo discrepo. Mm -hmm. I beg to differ. Yo discrepo. El vino tinto es mejor que el vino blanco. <risa> Pero por supuesto que no, yo en eso discrepo. El vino blanco es mucho mejor que el vino tinto. Bueno. <risa> <risa> ok, so the following ones are strong, so use them carefully, only with someone you truly know. Uh, so, well, the first one is, eso no tiene ni pies ni cabeza. Eso no tiene ni pies ni cabeza. That doesn't make any sense. For example, en la fiesta pasada yo fui el alma de la fiesta. Efraín, eso no tiene ni pies ni cabeza. Tú eres muy serio. Siempre en una fiesta te quedas sentado y no haces nada. Además, ni fui a esa fiesta. The next one is no. ¿Qué dices? No. What are you saying? No. ¿Qué dices? For example, la saga Star Wars es la mejor de toda la existencia. No. ¿Qué dices? La mejor es Indiana Jones. What? No digas tonterías. Ambos sabemos que la mejor es Harry Potter. Uh, by the way, no digas tonterías. Don't talk nonsense. No digas tonterías. ¿Viste el partido entre el América y las Chivas? Por supuesto que las Chivas jugaron mejor. Estoy en desacuerdo. Esos chicos ni siquiera saben patear el balón. Los mejores son los Pumas. ¿Cómo que los mejores son los Pumas? Si van hasta el final de la tabla. No es cierto. Actualiza tu información. Van en noveno lugar de 10 lugares. No es cierto. Siempre han sido unos perdedores. Como tú. Todos mis amigos dicen lo mismo. Eso no tiene sentido. Tú ni siquiera tienes amigos. Perdón, Efraín, pero yo en eso discrepo. Te tengo a ti. No. ¿Qué dices? Siempre me estás atacando. Esos no son amigos. No digas tonterías, solo es mi forma de bromear contigo. Eso no tiene ni pies ni cabeza. Uh, a mí no me causa ninguna gracia. Está bien, ya. Perdón. Bueno, ya. That's it for today, my beautiful friends from SpanishPole101.com. We hope that you have enjoyed this video. If so, please give it your thumbs up and share it with other learners. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and activate the channel notifications. And also, if you have any comment or opinion, leave it in the comment section down below because we do read them and reply to them. So, see you in our next video, guys. Hasta luego. Hello, my friends from SpanishPole101.com. As you might know, my name is Pepe. And I'm Ricardo. <laughs> of course, we're kidding. My name is Diego. And I'm Ricardo. <laughs> so, in today's video, we're going to learn how to use the object pronoun 
le in Mexican Spanish because there are so many ways to use le but in Mexican Spanish we have a particular use of this object pronoun so hopefully guys you will enjoy this video te vamos a volar la cabeza so in this video we won't focus on the difference between direct object and indirect object pronoun but let me explain for you very fast the indirect object pronoun really short, okay? Uh, the indirect object pronoun is is what, who, or whom the action of the verb is being done for. Let me give you an example. Quiero ir a comprar flores para mi novia. Bueno. Pero tú ni siquiera tienes novia, ¿no? ¿De qué estás hablando? No, es lo que te estoy diciendo, que solamente es un ejemplo. Right. So, in this example, the action is to buy, comprar. Um, the direct object are the flowers, because that's, um, those are what we are buying, okay? Las flores. And the indirect object pronoun is my girlfriend, because she is what? We are buying the flowers for. Y sigues con lo de tu novia que entiende que no tiene nada. Ah, que sí, que nomás es un ejemplo. De todos modos, sí tengo. Now that we recognize what the indirect object is, in this case is mi novia, let me tell you something. We can normally recognize the indirect object because these are preceded by prepositions such as a or para. Like in this example is quiero comprar flores para mi novia. So you see here you have the preposition para, then mi novia is the indirect object. Mm -hmm. Now, what we can do is we can kind of condense, shorten this sentence and only say quiero comprarle flores. Why? Because le is kind of a shortcut of mi novia. So this only le, this object pronoun, is basically mi novia. Quiero comprarle flores. Diego, ¿este tema está fácil? Pues mira, no es de los más sencillos, pero tampoco de los más complicados, pero ¿qué le vamos a hacer? Vamos a intentar explicarlo de una forma sencilla para la audiencia. Hmm, by the way, ¿qué le vamos a hacer? So in this case, la partícula le, the particle le, mm -hmm. what does it mean? Does it mean an indirect object? Well, not really an indirect object. No, not really. So in this case, what we do in Mexico is we use a lot le for the verb hacer specifically. So in such expressions such as ¿Qué le vamos a hacer? So in this case, don't try to, to get the indirect object. It doesn't exist. The closest thing to this le is a esta situación, to this situation. So, ¿qué vamos a hacer a esta situación? In this situation, what are we going to do? Yeah. Okay, so once again, one of the uses of le in Mexican Spanish is with the verb hacer. So you can use le in order to make a request, but not all requests but a kind one or when you want to make a prompt request or even to soften a request for example Diego toma un poco de tequila no gracias ahorita no no, no quiero tómale te va a gustar bueno pero a cambio de que cantes una canción Ah, oh, pero es que mi garganta. Vamos, cántale. Ya está cerrada con tres candados y remachada <risa> la puerta <risa> se negra. <risa> so another use of le is for encouragement. Yeah. And this is only used for the imperative version of the verb, the imperative tense, especially for tú and usted. Mm -hmm. So, in this case, for example, we have the verb andar, which is uh, walk, or even caminar. The imperative for tú will be anda or camina. However, we can use in Mexico le at the end of this imperative uh, just to stress or to give extra encouragement as, as a way for an urge to do it now. 
Okay, so once again we can say andale or caminale. It is not uncommon to hear in Mexico the moms who say things like Andale, correle a la escuela que no vas a llegar. Pásale a la casa, no estés allá afuera. Apúrale, rápido. Párale, pues si no tenemos prisa, párale. Ay, jálale, jálale. Pregúntale a la señora. Pregúntale, no sea tímido, chamaco. Ay, mamá, sí. Ay, pícale. Vas bien lento, te voy a dar con la chancla. No, mamá, no, Pícale. No, 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 no. Mira, no, vas no, a ver. No, no. Vas a ver. Dale, dale. Note this. Not all the all the verbs can can be used with the object pronoun le. The most common ones are for movement or the most common verbs can be used with le. For example, muévele, lele, juégale, párale. Hmm. Nice, very nice. Finally, we're going to give you three very common interjections in Mexico that use this object pronoun le. The first one, we're sure that you know it and is orale. Once again, Orale. So an orale has many meanings, but we will break it down in just two, which are the most common ones. Yeah. And uh, so the first one is as a kind of surprise mm -hmm. for something. Okay. Yeah. So for example, Diego, voy a ser papá. Orale, Efraín, pero si tú ni novia tienes. Ah, es lo que te digo es un ejemplo. So, the second use of orale is for encouraging someone. It's very close to, uh, come on, do it. For example, Diego, no sé si hablarle. Mm. Orale, márcale, mándale un mensaje, orale. The second interjection is epale. And epale, its closest meaning in English is kind of like, whoa, like, hey, what are you doing? Like, whoa. So, for example, epale, ¿por qué me estás pellizcando? ¿Qué te pasa? Epale. And the third interjection is ujule. Once again, ujule, which is once again used for surprise, but it has also a kind of a bit of despise in something, okay? For a certain situation. For example, Ay, no creo terminar el trabajo. Que debe, que debe de ver a mi amigo a las 5. ¿Y qué hora es? Las 5 y 10. Ujule, no, pues no creo que termines ni tu trabajo ni que alcances de ver a tu amigo. Ujule. That's it for today, my friends of SpanishPod101.com. We are really happy that you watched us. Um, give us your thumbs up, write your comments down below, and subscribe to this channel. Nos vemos en el siguiente video. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Hey there friends of SpanishPod101.com Hey, si yo llego con 10 tacos, ¿sonreirías? Bueno, eso depende. ¿De qué? De si son tacos al pastor o tacos de canasta. Ah, digamos al pastor. Mm, bueno, también depende de si son de Doña Lucy o de Don Pepe. Cierto. So, we can't help you to choose a taco? No, but we can help you understand the conditionals in Spanish. Yeah! So, guys, my name is Diego. And I'm Efraín. Enjoy this video! Woo! Okay, guys, so the conditionals in Spanish are very similar to the conditionals in English. Why? Because in Spanish we also have four types of conditionals. We have the zero conditional, first, second, and third conditional. The thing is that the structure is also very similar. Because in English you have the if clause, which in Spanish will be la clausula si, and then you have the main clause, okay? So we have the same structure as in English. For example, Si yo tuviera dinero, coma, compraría una mansión. Mm -hmm. Or you can reverse the order and say first the main clause, la cláusula principal. 
eh, compraría una mansión si tuviera mucho dinero. Ok, so you can do this as well in Spanish. Stay with us because we will tell you the four types of conditional in a very brief way. As Diego said, like in English, Spanish conditionals can indicate different degrees of possibility in the future, in the present, in the past, okay? So they talk about, about things that didn't happen in the past, that they can talk about things that would happen in the future, and things that couldn't, that couldn't possibly happen, okay? Like this structure, si yo fuera tú, yo no, I can be him, mm -mm. but let's, let's see this example. Diego, si yo fuera tú, no le echaría tanta salsa a mi pozole. ¿De qué hablas? Es riquísimo el pozole con mucha salsa, excepto por la gastritis. <risa> Ok, guys, so the first one is a zero conditional. And the structure for this conditional is the following. Si, followed by un verbo en presente de indicativo, coma, y un verbo en presente de indicativo. Ok, so this zero conditional works the same as in English. It, it talks about something that is, is always or usually true. Yeah. Okay. For example, we have this, this common one. If you hit water, it boils. Si tú calientas el agua, hierve. Another one. Si tú presionas el botón de, de encendido, la luz se enciende. Um, another one. Si le envías un mensaje, te deja en leído. Now we have the first conditional. Use this conditional in order to express how something is possible or likely, um, as long as a condition is met, hmm. a certain condition. <laughs> Very good. The structure for this conditional is C plus presente indicativo, the present tense, comma, and then future tense, el futuro. Yeah. Let's give you a couple of examples. The first one, si me duele el estómago, iré a ver al doctor. Okay. Si me caso, ¿irás a mi boda? Claro, por supuesto. The next one. Si tomas mucho tequila, te emborracharás. Si hago mi tarea rápido, veré una película. Ok, guys, so now remember that these are just possibilities that might happen in the future. Ok, mm -hmm. so for example, let's take the tequila one. Si tomas mucho tequila, te emborracharás. Uh, I mean, the condition is that you drink a lot of tequila and the possibility is that you will get drunk. I mean, will you get drunk? It is not 100% sure because you might be very resistant to alcohol. In that case, you won't be drunk, but there is the huge possibility that you will become drunk and once again all these tenses could be inverted and say first the main clause and then you just need to lose the comma so te emborracharás si bebes mucho tequila yeah now we have the second conditional in spanish and this goes for uh, unreal or a hypothetical situations okay You use this one when you are daydreaming and you want to talk about possibilities that probably won't happen at all. Mm -hmm. Very good. So now the structure for this is the following. It's C plus imperfecto de subjuntivo. Don't get too stressed about it. Uh, it's actually very easy to yeah. understand the imperfecto subjuntivo. Then comma and after that the conditional. We will give you a couple of examples for this. The first one is, si yo tuviera novia, la invitaría a cenar todas las noches. Uh, si yo fuera un poco más alto, probablemente sería modelo. The next one, si yo tuviera mil seguidores de Instagram, sería muy feliz. Go and follow me now. <laughs> si yo me casara... ¿Irías a mi boda? <laughs> Por supuesto que sí. So, this example is the same one that he used before, uh, but in the previous version, he said, 
Si me caso, irás a mi boda. Mm -hmm. And in this case, he's saying, si me casara, irías a mi boda. So, oh. which one is correct? Well, actually, both of them you can say. However, there is a small difference. And the, di the difference is the degree of possibility for that to happen, the likeliness of that to happen. In the first example, si me caso, irás a mi boda. Let's suppose that he already has a girlfriend uh, <laughs> whom he... He plans to marry. So uh, the, the possibility is very high for him to marry. And the, in the second one, si me casara, irías a mi boda? In this case, he doesn't even possibly, he, he might not even have a girlfriend. Okay? So the likeliness of that to happen, of he married another, another girl, well, is very low. That's why we use in this case the second conditional, but both are possible it depends on the likeliness of the situation yeah so in spanish we have a common saying el hubiera no existe to talk about something that didn't happen in the past but it doesn't have real consequences in the present and but we use it in the third conditional it exists in the third conditional mm -hmm. and you use this one when you want to talk about something that didn't happen in the past and doesn't have real consequences. Yeah, exactly, and we use it a lot. So, you might have heard this word before, hubiera, and that's for the third conditional. And the structure is the following, C plus, plus cuan perfecto de subjuntivo, but I know it sounds very daunting, this term, this grammar term, but it is very easy. It is actually just the hubiera form with the uh, participio of a verb. Okay, we will give you some examples of this uh, in, in, in just a, a, few, a few seconds. And then we also have the second part, don't, don't forget to add the comma, and the second part is the conditional perfecto. And the conditional perfect is just the conditional of the verb haber plus the participio of another verb. I know it sounds like, oh my god, this is so difficult, but with maybe a couple of examples that, and you need to practice this, you will become very familiar with this with this topic. So let's see one example. Just imagine that uh, Ephraim went to a party and he didn't invite me. Uh, so he can say, Si te hubiera llamado, ¿habrías ido a la fiesta conmigo? No, igual estaba muy cansado. Mm. So he didn't call me, but anyways, I wouldn't have gone to that party. So like, habría sido? Like, no, not, not really. Okay, so another example, second example. Reprobamos el examen. Ya sé. Si hubiéramos estudiado, habríamos aprobado ese examen. Yeah. So here the thing is that we didn't study. That didn't happen. And as a consequence, in the present, we didn't pass the exam. So it's, so, it's like a consequence that won't even happen. Okay? Now that you have this form, we can do what we call the mixed conditionals. And the mixed conditionals is basically when we, when we combine the clauses. Okay? So, for example, we can combine the hubiera clause with maybe a consequence in the, in the present. Okay? So let's give you an example of these mixed conditionals. Si te hubieras llevado paraguas, no estarías enfermo ahorita. And here we are combining the clause of the third conditional. Si te hubieras llevado paraguas, plus the main clause in the second conditional. No estarías enfermo ahorita. Ok, now let's give you another example. Si la hubiera besado... En este momento seríamos novios. Hmm. Once again, he's combining the clause of the third conditional, the hubiera clause, plus the main clause of the second mm. conditional. Pretty easy. That's it for today, my friends from SpanishBowl101.com. We hope that you have enjoyed this video. If so, please give it your thumbs up and write a comment down below. We will read them and reply yeah. to them. So... Once again, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and see you in our upcoming video. Hasta luego! Woo! Hey there, friends of SpanishPod101.com. Today we decided to go out and ask some random people what are 
their favorite Mexican slangs. Yeah, exactly. So enjoy the video. Woo! Hola. Hola. ¿Cómo te llamas? Martín. Oye, Martín, ¿cuál es tu palabra mexicana favorita? Este, no es palabra, es expresión. Me Ajá. gusta, bueno, utilizo mucho ¿Cómo crees? ¿Cómo crees? Ajá. Ajá. Así como, ¿cuándo ¿Cómo la crees? usas? Ajá, pues no sé, alguien no me... No manches, conocí a Clara. Ajá, ah, ¿cómo crees? Exacto. Exacto sí. <risa> Hola, ¿cómo te llamas? Jocelyn. Jocelyn. Dime, Jocelyn, ¿cuál es tu palabra mexicana favorita? Mm, chingón. ¿Chingón? ¿Cómo lo usarías? Chillona, pero chingona. <risa> Eso está chingón. <risa> Hola, ¿cómo te llamas? Daniela. Daniela. ¿Y cuál es tu expresión o palabra mexicana favorita? No, no, no mames. <risa> ¿No mames? ¿Y cómo lo usarías? Un tiempo la uso. <risa> bueno, puede ser... Um, Como cuando algo me sorprende. Ah, claro, cuando algo te sorprende. Eh, oye, ¿qué crees? Me encontré dinero en la calle. No mames. Exacto. <risa> Hola, ¿cómo te llamas? Hola, me llamo Tamara. Oh, oye, Tamara, ¿y cuál es tu palabra o expresión mexicana favorita? Tacos. Tacos, vale. ¿Y cómo la puedes usar en una oración? Voy a ir a cenar tacos. Bien, perfecto. ¿Cuáles son tus tacos favoritos? Los de pastor. Ah, por supuesto, son los mejores, muy bien. Hola, ¿cómo te llamas? Omar. Y dime Omar, ¿cuál es tu palabra o expresión mexicana favorita? Ay güey Ay güey Ok, ¿y qué significa eso? Pues de expresión, como de susto, de alegría, de emoción Ok, como por ejemplo, dame un ejemplo, ¿cómo la puedes usar? Um, Ay güey, ese güey se mató <risa> Ok, perfecto, ok Hola, ¿cómo te llamas? Mike Mike, dime, ¿cuál es tu palabra mexicana favorita? Güey. Güey, ok. ¿Y para ti qué es güey? Pues como tu compa o tu carnal o así. Ajá, o exacto. Tu amigo. tu amigo puede ser. ¿Y cómo lo usarías en una oración? Mm, mi amigo está bien güey. <risa> bueno, ok. Hola, ¿cómo te llamas? César Mauricio. César, ¿y cuál es tu palabra mexicana favorita? La típica, cabrón. Cabrón, muy bien. ¿Y para ti qué es cabrón? Es como ser alguien superior, ¿no? Alguien que se quiere sentir así muy, muy importante. Alguien que puede resolver todo. Ok. ¿Y cómo lo usarías tú? Uh... Soy un... Soy un cabrón. <risa> bien. Pero también puede ser está cabrón el sí, asunto. O sea, la puedes hacer como, como, como componerla, ¿no? Para agregarle más palabras. Claro, o sea, claro. Soy un cabrón. Ese güey es un cabrón. Ajá. Muy bien, muy Se bien. Se pasa de cabrón. Se pasa de cabrón también puede ser. Claro. Es una palabra con muchos significados. Sí. Hola, ¿cómo Ajá. te llamas? Dana. Dana, ¿cuál es tu palabra mexicana favorita? Pues uso mucho chale o chido. <risa> ¿Chale? ¿Y para ti qué es chale? Pues es un modismo como equivalente a decir ya que. Ok, ya que, ¿y cómo lo usarías tú en una frase o en tu vida? ¿Cómo la usas? Pues es como un chale, me fue mal en la escuela o en un examen. Ok, <risa> chale, me fue mal. ¿Y te fue bien? Sí. Ah, qué bueno. <risa> Muchas gracias. Sí, de que... <risa> Hola, chicas, ¿cómo se llaman? Yelitza, Jackie. Jackie y Yelitza, ¿cuál es su palabra mexicana favorita? Mm, a la chingada. A la chingada. Oh. Y yo digo mucho chafa. Chafa, muy bien. Bien, ¿y a la chingada para ti qué es? Como una forma rápida de darle fin a algo. Ok. ¿Y chafa? Chafa yo lo, utiliza, lo utilizo generalmente como para alguien como digo, ay, qué chafa, o sea, esa persona no lo hizo bien uh -huh. o, o bien arreglado mal, pues viene como muy chafa, no sé. <risa> ok. Sí, sí queda. ¿Y tú cómo usarías a la chingada? Mm, pues cuando estoy discutiendo con alguien y ya no quiero seguir haciéndolo, pues ya es más fácil a la chingada y ya. Para decirle a la chingada, <risa> vete, ok. Muy bien, muchas gracias, chicas. Hola, ¿cómo te llamas? Me llamo Luis Fernando. Luis Fernando, ¿cuál es tu palabra mexicana favorita? Eh, yo creo que mi palabra favorita es chela. Chela. ¿Y para ti qué es? Bueno, ¿qué es chela? Eh, bueno, aquí en México chela se le llama la cerveza. Uh -huh. ¿Y cómo la usarías en una oración? En una oración, vete güey, vamos por unas chelas. Ándale, ah, 
Y vamos justo ahorita por unas. <laughs> okay, yeah, bro, that was very fun to, yeah. to record and to, to watch. So, uh, I want to ask you, what's your favorite Mexican word? Well, my favorite Mexican word is chido. I chido. really like that one. What is that, Efraín? Okay, chido is like good, nice, cool. Okay. okay? It's like saying... Tu playera está muy chida. Ah, muchas gracias. Your t-shirt is really cool. Good, nice. Uh, oh. mine, <laughs> I'm sorry for not asking. What's yours? Mine is, um, well, I have several, but I think that the one that I use uh, very frequently uh -huh. is um, bato. Bato? Yeah, bato. And bato is like saying dude or, or friend. Okay. okay. It's like, hey, bato, eh, vamos por unos tacos. Like saying, like hey. saying, hey, dude, hey, hmm? friend, <laughs> let's go <laughs> and get some tacos. That's cool. Sí, so, vato, vamos por unos tacos. Wow. A lot of Mexican words, huh? Yeah, oh, yeah, there are several. And you have just watched like a very small sample of Mexican words. Yep. There are more and more and more and more. So, keep watching this video so you can get uh, even more vocabulary, more Mexican words. And, well... Thanks for watching us guys, um, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel, yep. activate the channel notifications, and see you in our upcoming video. Hasta luego! Hey there friends of SpanishPod101.com, during these days we decided to go out and ask people about their jobs, how much time do they work, um, exactly, like if they have any rest day in the, the week, yeah. how much time they do for uh, commuting, and also what are their duties in their job. Uh, yes, of course, so if you are interested, please enjoy this video. Woo! ¿Y cuántas horas trabajas? Mira, yo comúnmente trabajo ocho horas diarias. ¡Wow! Ocho horas diarias. Claro. ¿Y de descanso cuánto tiempo tienes? Mira, yo me trabajo de lunes a sábado y el domingo descanso. Comúnmente yo empiezo a trabajar a partir de las ocho de la mañana hasta las cinco de la tarde. ¿Consideras que los mexicanos trabajan mucho? Mira, aquí el mexicano siempre se queja de todo. Que porque trabaja mucho se siente muy cansado. Que porque trabaja poco... Pues lo mismo, ahora sí que si trabaja poco dices que no hay trabajo, ¿qué hago? Siempre el mexicano pone pretextos para todo. Y César, ¿de qué trabajas? Mira, yo trabajo en las aplicaciones que reparten comida. Oh, Aparte, okay. pues estudio la carrera de optometría. Ah, vaya, genial. Sí. Pues bueno, César, que tengas un buen día y que termines pronto. Muchas gracias, igualmente. Hola, ¿cómo te llamas? Daniela. Daniela. Oye, ¿a qué te dedicas? Soy maestra. ¿Eres maestra? Sí. Ok. ¿Y cuántas horas trabajas? Ocho. 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 Bien. ¿Y de qué hora a qué hora trabajas? De siete y media a tres y media. Ok, muy bien. Oye, Daniela, ¿y cuánto tiempo tienes para comer? Una hora. ¿Una hora nada más? ¿Y crees que los mexicanos trabajan mucho? Algunos, ¿no? Ay. Pero la gran mayoría sí son jornadas de ocho horas. Por más de ocho horas. Bueno, ¿qué tal? Buenas tardes. ¿Cómo se llama? Policía 560850 Martínez Cerecedo, yo. Mucho gusto. Yo soy Efraín. Y bueno, le voy a hacer una pregunta. ¿En qué consiste su trabajo? ¿En qué consiste mi trabajo? En realizar recorridos alternos en todo el bosque. Asimismo, prevenir que fumen, que tomen, que porten bebidas alcohólicas, armas. Asimismo, prevenir el asalto. Este, prevenir el asalto. Ok. El Muy bien. ¿Y cuántas horas a la semana trabaja? Depende, puede ser tanto 24 hasta puedo aventarme 75 horas por 3 días. Por 3 días. En la semana puedo decirte 24, 24, 48, sumo otras 48. Ok. Pues, ¿y, en qué, ¿Y en qué días descansa o cómo consiste? Mm, puede ser, son salteados, sería un día trabajado y un día descansado. Ok, muy bien. ¿Usted considera que los mexicanos trabajan muchas horas? Sí. ¿Qué tal? Buenas tardes, ¿cómo se llama? Antonio Álvarez Botello, servidor. Muchas gracias, señor Antonio. Y dígame, ¿cuántas horas trabaja usted al día? Pues más de 12. ¿Más de 12? Casi 14. ¿De qué hora a qué hora? De como de 7 a 8, a veces hasta las 9 de la noche. 
bueno, es un montón. ¿Y en qué consiste su trabajo? De vender raspados, agua, refresco preparado. Y bueno, ¿usted considera que los mexicanos trabajan mucho? Bueno, al menos yo sí. Hay algunos que no. Y bueno, pues sí, hay algunos que no. Sí, pero, no. pero ¿qué tal? ¿Qué tanto dinero ganan en proporción a lo que trabajan? Ah, no, pues yo pongo un poquito más de sueldo mínimo porque me dan 150 diarios. Okay. Pero pues la verdad siento que es poco para lo que trabajo. Para lo que usted hace. Ahora Bien. Eh, y bueno, una pregunta más. ¿Qué días descansa usted? Los martes. Los martes nada más. Solo un día a la semana descansa. Sí, porque viernes, sábado y domingo es el día de más friega para mí. Ok. Como saco varios puestos, ah. vienen otras personas a trabajar, pero yo tengo que preparar todo. Bien. Tanto las mieles como surtir agua, refrescos y eso. Ok. Buenas tardes. ¿Cómo se llama? Me llamo Hamlet Flores. Hamlet. Eh, pues una pregunta. ¿Cuántas horas trabaja usted al día? Eh, alrededor de 10 horas. 10 horas. Y bueno, ¿qué días descansa usted? Y el día domingo. ¿Solamente un el día? El domingo, ajá, sí. Lunes, bueno, ok. ¿Y en qué consiste su trabajo? Eh, bueno, está, bueno, el área de donde estoy yo es de ventas, el área de ventas. Pero así que llegar, visitar a los clientes. Y ahora sí que hacer la venta en cada cliente. Bueno, visitar todos los clientes. Uh -huh. Ok, muy bien. ¿Y usted considera que los mexicanos trabajan mucho y, em, y reciben poco sueldo? Pues yo creo que es, depende de la... Pues que el desempeño... Bueno, ahora sí que el área donde se desempeña uno trabajando, ¿no? Claro. Pero, por ejemplo, yo aquí en... Ahora sí que en el área donde yo estoy, pues, pues no me quejo. Pues, pues sí, sí me va bien. Ok, muy bien. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo se llama? Soy Miguel Ángel Romero Flores, soy jefe de carrera de Ingeniería Bioquímica, soy profesor, eh, doy clases de Ingeniería Bioquímica de tiempo completo. Perfecto, ¿y cuánto, cuántas horas trabaja la semana? En papel tengo 40 horas, eh, en la práctica pues, estoy entre 40 y 50 horas dependiendo de la demanda de trabajo que tenga para, para cada proceso. Ahorita acabamos de terminar lo que es el rediseño curricular de la carrera y eso demandó mucho tiempo extra, entonces estaba 50, 45 horas a la semana. ¿Y cuánto tiempo de vacaciones generalmente tiene al año? Los periodos vacacionales del calendario de la SEP, el de... Año Nuevo, Semana Santa y Julio. ¿Y considera que los mexicanos trabajan mucho? Mm, es que se desperdicia mucho el tiempo que estamos en el trabajo. Uh -huh. eh, creo que hay personas que vienen, no sé, ocho horas, pero realmente de trabajo efectivo hacen dos. Entonces, eh, y habíamos otras, por el cargo que tengo, eh, termino haciendo más horas de lo, de, de, de lo habitual, pero creo que no, no optimizamos tanto el tiempo de trabajo, se desperdicia mucho. Y última pregunta, eh, ¿cuánto tiempo hace de su domicilio aquí a su trabajo? 40 minutos. Ok, muchas gracias. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo se llama? Argelia Rivera Vargas. ¿Y en qué trabaja? Bueno, yo tengo dos empleos, uno es que soy profesora aquí en el Instituto Político Nacional, y el otro es que soy especialista en análisis de riesgo y soy gerente de riesgo en una empresa. Ah, perfecto. ¿Y cómo es que lleva estos dos trabajos? Pues corriendo, <risa> realmente <risa> corriendo. Ajá. ¿Cuánto tiempo trabaja aquí como profesora? Bueno, aquí tengo muy poquitas horas, son 15 horas de base, entonces me permite realizar otras actividades y no son como que todo un día completo, no. Uh -huh. Entonces eso me, eso me ayuda a que pueda hacer otras actividades. Y como analista de riesgo, ¿cuántas horas trabaja a la semana? Bueno, pues es por proyecto, un proyecto puede ser de un mes, de tres meses, dependiendo del sistema que estemos operando, es análisis de riesgo para el sector de hidrocarburos, entonces puede haber proyectos que duren seis meses y pues yo ahí ya distribuyo mis horarios para poder cumplir aquí y poder este, terminar allá, obviamente la mayor parte pues es en la parte de, de riesgo en la otra. En la otra. ¿Y cuáles son los días eh, donde descansa? Descanso. Yo creo que yo no descanso porque aparte soy mamá, entonces sábado y domingo es completamente hacer mis actividades de, de casa, incluso entre semana. Entonces yo creo que no tengo día de descanso. ¿Y vacaciones? Pues mmm, a veces, yo creo que una vez al año, uh, 
con mis hijos, eh, pero realmente no, no, no hay una fecha que te diga, porque hay proyectos que regularmente, por ejemplo, ahorita hay un proyecto que inició y literal todo diciembre tenemos que trabajarlo porque se tiene que entregar en enero. Ok, y una pregunta, ¿considera que los mexicanos trabajan mucho? Sí, yo considero que los mexicanos trabajamos mucho y yo creo que aunque suene uh, completamente de género, creo que las mujeres mexicanas trabajamos de mucho porque aparte de ser de trabajar en, nuestra, en nuestro rubro en lo que nos especializamos, tenemos que trabajar en casa, ¿no? O sea, el ser mamá, el atender a tus hijos, esa parte. ¿Cuánto tiempo se hace su trabajo a, a su casa o, bueno, de su casa a su trabajo? Bueno, mira, ahorita, por ejemplo, de aquí de Politécnico, me llevo a hacer dos horas y media, a veces hasta tres horas, dependiendo del tráfico. Porque eh, yo vivo, ¿Ida y vuelta? Y, eh, ida y vuelta, sí, serían como seis horas o cuatro horas, dependiendo del tráfico y de las horas en las que me toque. Si tocan horas pico, igual. Ahorita del otro trabajo, ahorita, por ejemplo, vengo de Polanco uh -huh. y hicimos hora y media por el tráfico. Realmente es muy pesado moverse en la Ciudad de México. Ok, muchísimas gracias. No, ok, hasta luego. Ok, guys, so... Yes, in fact, we discovered that Mexicans do work a lot and some of them even work for more than eight hours straight during a day. Uh, uh -huh. Some of them don't even have a rest day. Um, and also, well, uh, something that was astonishing to me was the fact that some of them take at least one to two hours for commuting a and lot. that's only one way. So only you, one way. Yeah, if you sum up uh, like the round trip that your commute, your full commute, it takes four hours. That's a lot. Yeah. So I'm impressed by that. So please, guys, share it with us. Uh, if something impressed you. Write your comments down there. If if there is something that you might want to ask or uh -huh. to add, please let us know in the comment section down below. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. If you want any other interview or you want to suggest another topic, please leave it down here. And of course, see you in our next video, guys. Hasta luego. Want to speak real Spanish from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at SpanishPod101.com. Hey, hello there, my friends from SpanishPod101.com. My name is Diego. And I'm Efraín. And in today's video, we're going to cover some verbs that can be used apart from a star with the gerund. Specifically, we're going to talk about mm. the perífrasis verbales. Wow. So, enjoy this video! Woo! So, the verbs in Spanish have three common endings. The first one is AR, such as cantar, to sing, or amar, to love. Okay, the next ending is ER, um, such as comer. To eat. Um, another one, correr, to run. Okay, the next one is IR. For example, vivir, to live, salir, to go out. Very good, nice. Now, the gerund, how is it formed? In order to form the gerund, uh, we need to drop the endings and add something at the end. Therefore, for the verbs that ends in AR, such mm -hmm. as the verb hablar or cantar, we just need to drop the AR and then instead adding ando. Therefore, the verbs converts to hablando or cantando. Yeah. That's for the verbs that ends in AR. For the verbs that ends in ER, such as the verb correr or mm -hmm. comer, you need to drop the ER and then add yendo. Therefore, the verb would be comiendo or corriendo. Finally, we have the verbs that ends in IR. Now, for these verbs, uh, you need to do the same. You need to drop mm -hmm. the IR and then just adding yendo. So, in the case of vivir, it will be viviendo. Oh. Or even salir, it will be saliendo. It is important to remember that the gerund could be either regular or irregular. In this video, we're just going to focus on the regular ones mm -hmm. because uh, the, the irregular ones and how to use properly the gerund is topic for another video. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so um, we will just focus in present progressive in this video too. Okay, um, for this, 
you will have to use the auxiliary verb estar. For example, yo estoy hablando. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Tú estás cantando. Uh -huh. <laughs> Ellos están comiendo. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Very good. So, in Mexico, you can use this synonym, estar and andar, okay? You can use either of them interchangeably. And, okay, for example, Diego está comiendo. You can change the verb estar to andar. Diego anda comiendo. And it doesn't change the meaning. Exactly. So once again, the auxiliary verb could be either estar or andar. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now we have another subset of, of verbs uh, that can be used with the gerund and uh, we call this a periphrasis verbal. And yeah. a periphrasis verbal basically is when you link together two verbs, but the meaning of the first verb changes completely. Uh, we have another type of periphrasis verbal where the, when the uh, first verb is actually changed because of the gerund. Therefore, the course of the action of the first verb is changed. So the, the gerund works kind of as an adverb. We will give you some examples of this to clarify. Let's start with a periphrasis verbal where the verb changes its meaning. So one of these is the verb seguir, which mm -hmm. originally means to follow. Once again, the verb seguir. The verb seguir could be followed by a gerund. And when this happens, when you mix, when you link together the verb seguir plus a gerund, the meaning now will be to keep doing something for, for a certain time. So, for example, Efraín, ¿tú sigues estudiando? Sí, sí sigo estudiando. So, here you see, the, I'm not saying, hey, Efraín, do you follow to study? No, but rather, sigues estudiando means, do you keep studying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, we have another uh, verb, and this verb is? Llevar. Okay. Llevar. Um, you can use this verb, and its meaning is to bring or? To take. Or to take, depending on the context. Okay, but when you use it before a gerund, the meaning changes because in this case it means that you have been doing something in a certain amount of time. Yeah. Okay, for example, Diego, ¿cuánto tiempo llevas practicando box? Okay, yo llevo practicando box cinco años. Wow. I've been doing some boxing for five years. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, very good, guys. Now, we're going to show you another list of verbs. And in this case, these are verbs that are changed due to the gerund. Therefore, this gerund works as a kind of an adverb. So, it replies to how the action is being done or performed. So, there's another type of verbs that can be used with the gerund. And now, these type of verbs are modified because of this gerund um, so they are modified in the course of the action okay they don't change the meaning itself mm -hmm. but they change the how they are being done okay the course of the action so for example one of these verbs is continuar mm -hmm. okay to continue for example Efraín continúas viendo la telenovela eh, Rubí Ah, uh, sí, claro. Ya voy en el capítulo 235. What? It's a very long telenovela. It's fun. Ok. <laughs> ok, fun. Ok, the next one. Empezar. Let's go to an example. Diego, ¿recuerdas cuando en esa fiesta de Ricardo empecé pidiéndole unos tragos... A la chava. Sí, fue una pésima estrategia esa. No, no soy muy bueno en eso. Tal vez algún día mejore. Pésima estrategia. <laughs> ok, guys. So, the next one is acabar, which originally means to, to finish or to end, to end up. So, uh, for example, 
Eh, Efraín, ¿recuerdas cuando fuimos al karaoke y <ríe> terminamos cantando todas las canciones de Luis Miguel? Claro, fue muy divertido. Súper divertido. The next one is venir. For example, Diego, el otro día fui con Hugo hacia la escuela y en todo el camino venía repitiendo sus líneas para la exposición. Mm, a veces Hugo puede ser muy fastidioso. Ah, lo es. Ok, ok. The last verb here is ir. Mm -hmm. And once again, ir, which means to go, could be a mix with a gerund. Let's see an example. Efraín, tengo, tengo mucha hambre. Eh, ¿Por qué no vamos corriendo a la tienda y compramos algo para comer? Vamos. Yeah, why not? That's it for today, my friends of SpanishPod101.com. And please, let us know if you like this video. Write your comments down below. And give us your thumbs up, of course. Um, subscribe to this channel if you has, uh, haven't done it yet. And see you in our next video. Hasta luego. See you guys. Hello there, my friends from SpanishPod101.com. As you might know, my name is Raúl. And I'm Ricardo. Okay, no, of course we're kidding. My name is Diego. And I'm Efraín. And in today's video, we're going to learn how to roll your Arrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Basically, we can say that the alveolar ring is just behind your front teeth. So your front teeth, the alveolar ring is right here. It's a rock part. Yep. So the second exercise is knowing that you can do a lip trill, okay? And you can achieve this sound through repeating or imitating the sound of an engine, mm -hmm. like <laughs> or even when you are cold. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is important so you can visualize how the trill works mm -hmm. and the same movement that your lips make is by blowing out uh, but keeping a very small gap in your lips. Yep. This is what will make this sound. So you're blowing but if you close your lips little by little eventually this trill will um will be so will come out. Yeah. Will come out. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So this is the same movement that your tongue will make inside your mouth yeah. as long as it is in the alveolar ring. And this is the basis of rolling your R's. Very good. Now that you have mastered the lip trill, we can proceed to the next step. So this step is, believe it or not, just making the sound. Oh, yes. Like when you are in a cinema and you want, or in a library and someone is talking, what do you do? So obviously you know how to make this sound, but the importance is not just to make this sound, but rather to try to stop this sound with your tongue. That is putting your tongue in be behind your front teeth in the alveolar yeah. ring and the try alveolar. to stop it. Eventually, and with practice, your tongue will start to vibrate. So let's try it. So you see, he has mastered that sound. <laughs> Very good. So this is the second step. This is important because this will make you aware of that your tongue needs to be relaxed. Maybe my tongue is not being that relaxed because I'm talking too much, but your tongue needs to be relaxed so your tongue start vibrating. Yeah. So once again, very good guys. So now that you have mastered this, we can proceed to the following step. And what's the following step? You didn't tell me, man. TV. So you have to keep in mind these three things um, for doing this exercise. The amount of airflow on the second one is uh, the gap of air. Um, this gap between the tip of your tongue and the palate. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And the third one is how relaxed your tongue is, which is really important to get that vibration, vibration, okay? So, very good. Now that your tongue is already vibrating, it could sound more like a jackhammer in a construction. <laughs> or a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> but you are really close now to the to the tongue trill, a useful tongue trill for your R's in Spanish. Yeah, which is called the alveolar tongue trill. Yep. Now, we have reached the point where we can get the trill that makes the rolled R's. Okay. Um, this is a little bit different uh, than the closed trill, which we learned before. But in this case, your mouth will be more open and the tip of your tongue must, must approach the roof of your mouth. Um, it's a little bit more difficult, but here's how we can do it. Exactly. So once again, the tip of your tongue must uh, um, touch the alveolar ring. Once again, that is right behind your teeth. Mm -hmm. And it, your tongue needs to have like a new shape. Okay, a new shape where 
the tip touches slightly just your ring alveolar ring now your mouth in this case should be slightly open that is like this if you don't know how, where to play your tongue it's the same as when you say the english word t t once again so in this case what we're going to do is the same what you did with the sh sound so the first thing is that you need to blow out some air not too much not too little but enough to vibrate your tongue once again however this might not be easy at first why because you need to have the u shape you need to have your tongue relax okay so i will try to do it uh so please uh look very closely t t eventually if you practice enough you will find you will find how to relax your tongue and after some time you will develop finally your roll r there you have it once again the sh sound or the closed trill the alveolar sound very good nice. and now you need to practice this remember something very important here guys when you learn how to whistle uh, normally you don't learn any two or three days but rather it takes you slightly more and you need constant constant practice to mm -hmm. master how to whistle it's the same practice that you need to yeah. roll your r's um finally and this is like a final note where you will use this uh, alveolar sound this alveolar trill okay guys now it is important to know where to use this alveolar trill and you can use it in three occasions first of all when the words start with an R or mm -hmm. end with an R, okay? So let's start with some words that start with an R. For example, rojo, rojo, mm -hmm. Roma, Raúl, Raúl, Ricardo. Mm -hmm. Or there are also some words that end with an R. For wow. example, color sabor mm -hmm. very good or uh, even correr yeah correr now obviously here uh, I'm kind of exaggerating this sound mm -hmm. but even if I do it in a normal pace you will see how I need to roll my R's Roma Ricardo rojo sabor color very good. Correr. Okay, so um, the uh, alveolar thrill is also very useful when you see a double R. He used this example, correr. <laughs> correr. <laughs> correr, which also has a double R. But we also have this word, ferrocarril. Can you pronounce it? Ferrocarril. Or the single word, carril, carril. Or mm, the word correr, conjugated in first person, corro, corro. Mm, very good. That's it for today, my friends of SpanishPod101.com. I hope that you have enjoyed this video. Give us your thumbs up. Share this video with other learners that want to pronounce the R, okay? and click on the notifications subscribe to this channel see you <laughs> in our next video <laughs> hasta luego mijo no hagas esos ruidos no estés sorbiendo tu agua a ver saluda saluda hola diles quién eres hola me llamo diego y yo soy efraín Ah, hello, my beautiful <laughs> friends from Smashball101.com. 
Once again, as you might know, my name is Diego. And I'm Efraín. And in today's video, we're going to check some useful phrases for parents to talk to your kids. Mm -hmm. So, hopefully, guys, you will enjoy this video. Okay, guys, so we know that there are so many parents who are interested in knowing how to speak to their children in Spanish. Uh, what better way to start is familiarizing your children with this beautiful language than to mm -hmm. using some some useful phrases for them. So we're going to divide this video in four categories. The first one is in la casa, in the house. Yeah. So the first one. The first one is que te dejaron de tarea. Que te dejaron de tarea. What do you have for homework? Very good. Next one. The next one. Te acabaste tu lunch? Once again. Te acabaste tu lunch? Did you finish your lunch? Okay. Now, this one. No brinques en el sofá. No brinques en el sofá. Don't jump on the couch. Mm, very good. Mm. The next one. Bájate de la silla. Bájate de la silla. Get down from the chair. Yeah. Ok, the next one. Fíjate dónde caminas. Fica, fíjate dónde caminas. Look where you, are when, where you are walking. The next one is when you are on the table and your kids are misbehaving. Well, not necessarily misbehaving, but when you are just on the table eating with your children. Well, right? yeah, that's <laughs> something like So, you say these phrases when you are eating with your children on the table. Yeah. The first phrase is... <laughs> <laughs> the first one is, no hables con la boca llena. Claro. No hables con la boca llena. Don't talk with your mouth full. Ok, la siguiente. No te levantas hasta que termines tu comida. No te levantas hasta que termines tu comida. You don't get up until you finish your meal. Mm. My mom used to tell me that every time. Mm. Okay, the next one. Come con la boca cerrada. Come con la boca cerrada. Eat with your mouth closed. Okay. Quita tus codos de la mesa. Quita tus codos de la mesa. Get up your elbows from the table. Ooh. Yeah, my mom used to say that a lot of times too. <laughs> the next one. No sorbas la sopa. No sorbas la sopa. Yeah. Do not sip your soup. No eructes en la mesa. No eructes en la mesa. Don't burp on the table. Mm, that's disgusting. Yeah. Ahora te daremos unas frases para decirle a tu hijo o hija durante la mañana o antes de ir a la escuela. Mm -hmm, very good. So the first one is, buenos días, hora de despertar. Buenos días, hora de despertar. Good morning, time to wake up. Levántate, levántate, get up. Mm. The next one. Se va a hacer tarde. Se va a hacer tarde. It's going to be late. Vístete. Vístete. Put on your clothes. Mm, very good. Mm -hmm. The next one. ¿Qué quieres de desayunar? ¿Qué quieres de desayunar? What do you want for breakfast? The next one. Atate las agujetas. Atate las agujetas. Tie your laces. Ok, una muy importante. Lávate los dientes. Lávate los dientes. Brush your teeth. Very good. The next one. Peínate. Once again. Peínate. Comb your hair. Ok. Arregla tu mochila. Arregla tu mochila. Prepare your backpack. Another one could be 
abróchate el cinturón. Uh -huh. Once again, abróchate el cinturón. Yeah. Fasten your seat belt. Ahora te daremos frases para decirles a tus hijos todos los días, pero también para expresarles tu amor y darles ánimo. Very good. So, these phrases are very important for the self-esteem of your children. And what better way than to use them in Spanish? Yeah. The first one is te amo or te quiero. Mm -hmm. Once again, te amo or te quiero, which has a slight difference. Actually, it's about intensity. Te amo is more intense, te quiero is like, mm -hmm. but both mean I love you. Okay. The next one. Me haces muy feliz. Me haces muy feliz. You make me very happy. Mm, very nice. The next one. Ser tu papá o mamá es lo mejor que me ha pasado en la vida. Ser tu papá o mamá es lo mejor que me ha pasado en la vida. Being your dad or mom is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Yeah. The next one, confío en ti, confío en ti, I trust you. The next one, tú puedes hacerlo, tú puedes hacerlo, you can do it. The next one, hiciste un gran trabajo, hiciste un gran trabajo, you made a great job. Very good. The next one. Me haces sentir orgulloso. Mm -hmm. Me haces sentir orgulloso. You make me proud. Great. Next one. Te felicito. Te felicito. I congratulate you. That's it for today, my friends of SpanishPod101.com. Uh, please give us your thumbs up. Share this video with other learners and see you in our next video. Oh, click on the that, on the bell down there. Yeah, to activate the channel notifications yeah, and subscribe. stay tuned for our newest videos. And see you soon, guys. Hasta luego. Hey there, friends of SpanishPod101.com. So we are happy to be here with you with another topic. And today's topic is how to call your boyfriend or your girlfriend in Spanish. So, well, I used to call her... Corazón. Mm. That, that's a nice one. And I yeah. used to call her Amor. So, but in this video, you're going to learn more ways to call your boyfriend or girlfriend. So, enjoy this video. Woo! Okay, guys, so if you want to learn more variety on how to call your girlfriend or your boyfriend, uh, so this is the video that you should watch. As we have said at the beginning, the two most common ones in Spanish are, on the one hand, amor, uh -huh. and on the other hand, corazón. These are the two most common that you can listen to, at least here in Mexico. But yeah. what other ways uh, do you know for calling your girlfriend or, or, or even your, your boyfriend? So we, can, we will divide this lesson in, in two parts. The first one, the standard nicknames. Uh -huh. And apart from the standard nicknames, we have a, another part that is a cheesy nicknames. <laughs> if you want to be okay. a slightly more cheesy, yeah, we have we have some vocabulary for that. We so have this ones. Let's let's start with the standard. So the first one is amor, okay, uh -huh. which is love, amor. only love. Yeah. We have said that at the beginning. We also have corazón, and corazón means heart, <laughs> heart. What other do we have, Efraín? So in the standard vocabulary, we have this word, querido or querida. Which is dear, okay? Mm, yeah, very mm. nice. Mi querida, nos podemos ir ya? Oh, you're so romantic, man. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, the next one is preciosa, or in its ma masculine form, uh -huh. precioso, and that's gorgeous, <laughs> gorgeous. Preciosa o precioso, like, preciosa, nos vamos al cine? Sí. <laughs> <laughs> the next one, cariño. Um, which is darling, cariño, 
¿Cómo estás hoy? ¿Cómo te fue? ¡Ah! O oh, cariño, ¿vas a venir hoy? ¿Vas a venir a mi fiesta? No. <risa> <risa> bueno, by, by the way, cariño, uh, you cannot use it in masculine or feminine. It's, we can say that this is neuter. Okay, so it's cariño for your, your girlfriend or oh, cariño yeah. for your boyfriend. This uh -huh. is very important to note. I forgot to say that. No, but it's okay. It's okay. So let's see another word that it's very common, at least in Mexico, and that's bebé. And mm -hmm. even you can include bebé with a nice adjective, like, for example, bebé linda, bebé preciosa, for example. But oh, if not, you can only say bebé. And mm -hmm. bebé is baby. Once again, this is also a neuter. It's not masculine or feminine. It's mm -hmm. uh, bebé for girlfriend or boyfriend. Yeah. So the next one is princesa. Um, and this is for girlfriend. And if you have a boyfriend, you can use príncipe. You don't say princeso, príncipe. <laughs> <laughs> princeso, yeah, well, okay. actually we do have princeso, but that's for another lesson. Yeah, yeah. So, príncipe is for, for your boyfriend, mm -hmm. or princesa for your girlfriend, okay? Like, hey, ¿cómo estás, princesa? <laughs> Why are you telling? <laughs> Why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another one is cielo, and I like this a lot. Yeah. Cielo uh, in English is sky, and once again, this is neuter so mm -hmm. it is for your boyfriend or your girlfriend so like uh, cielo sky remember now what these three words have in common yeah. uh cielo and also princesa uh, and also um bebe is like you can make them in diminutive and with diminutive you need to add ito or ita uh -huh. exactly so for example Uh, and this is when you want to turn the word slightly more cheesy, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, so instead of saying, for example, cielo, I can say cielito. Cielito. Yeah. Or um, for bebé. Bebé. We, some people say bebito, but the right way to say it is bebecito. Or okay? bebecita. Bebecito or bebecita It's in the like case of feminine. Like that song. Bebecita. Have you? I, I haven't heard that Come song. on. No, that's 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 like, that's seriously, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> okay, or, or, or even, for example, uh, you can say princesa, princesa, obviously, in this case, you, is princesita, right? Because it's for feminine, princesita. So, if you want to turn these words slightly more cheesy, yes, of course, you can say this. And these are also very common, right? I, yeah. I hear all the time in the public transportation when someone is calling to her to her girlfriend, oh, la princesita, ¿cómo va tu día? Oh, hey, cielito. Or, yeah, Even cielito has a song. Cielito lindo. Eh, es el lunar que tiene cielito lindo. Very good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so now we are going to give you the cheesy words. And these are, uh, remember that you have to use them with diminutive. Yeah. Okay. Remember diminutive is ito or uh -huh. ita. Mm -hmm. So the first one is cosita. Mm. Like little thing. Little thing, hey. Ay, cosita, te ves hermosa. Ajá, yeah. Very good. So, Then cosita. you kiss your girlfriend. Or your boyfriend. Or your boyfriend. Yeah, cosita. 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 Oh, by the way, yeah, 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 yeah. Cosita could work for both, actually, cosita. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Another one could be pedacito de cielo, and I like this a lot, it sounds very cheesy, like, but also <laughs> romantic, I don't know, like, pedacito de cielo, which yeah. is like part of sky. Little part of Little sky. Little part of sky. Like, I, oh, I don't really use it in public, you know? No, I use it more, like, you can use it, of course, in text, no, mm -hmm. not in public, that sounds, like, extremely cheesy, yeah. but in text is good, like, hey, ¿cómo estás, pedacito de cielo? ¿Cómo amaneciste? Well, yeah, it's look, it's when you are really into someone. Exactly, when you are really into someone and you love her or you love him so much, you can write this, of course. Yeah. The next one is terroncito de azúcar. Little sugar cube. Yeah, okay. Terroncito de azúcar. Mi terroncito de azúcar. Ven aquí, te voy a abrazar. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, terroncito de azúcar. This is a nice word, actually. I, I like to use it, but uh, uh, once again, not in public. Not in public. Just, <laughs> okay. just, just maybe in text, and that's it. Yeah, uh, yeah. We have another, and this is the last one that we have, uh -huh. and um, the last one is panquecito or panquecita, panquecito or panquecita. 
So, and you use this, uh -huh. um, normally, normally, when your boyfriend or your girlfriend is slightly round, slightly <laughs> uh, fat, just slightly. So, you can use panquecito or panquecita, which is little cupcake. Okay, um, you can use panquecito for both, I mean, for your girlfriend and your boyfriend. You don't necessarily need to add the A at the end, panquecita. No, you can tell her, mi panquecito. Yeah, but you can also say panquecita, right? Like, well, yeah. you can use both. But for masculine, it is always panquecita. Oh, well, well, you, yeah. you were, so I, I, I wouldn't say, call you, yeah, ¿cómo yeah, estás, yeah. panquecita? That, like, no, I will no, never, no, no, no. I, will, I, will, I wouldn't even say that to you, man. So, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't want I, you I, to, I, I don't want you to tell me like that. Okay. Very good. And now the last word that we want to tell you is not really how to call your girlfriend, but how do you say cheesy? Because we have used this word a lot during this video. So what is the way in Spanish to say cheesy? Mm -hmm. The word is cursi. Cursi. So una vez más, estas cuatro palabras, eh, cosita, pedacito de cielo, terroncito de azúcar mm -hmm. y también panquecito, son palabras cursis, muy cursis. cursis. That's it for today, my beautiful friends from SpanishPole101.com. If you like this video, please give us your thumbs up. Don't forget to share this video with other learners. And also, if you have any comment or opinion or even feedback, please let us know in the comment section down below because we do read them yeah. and reply to them. And of course, don't forget also to subscribe to this beautiful channel and stay tuned for our upcoming videos, guys. Hasta luego. Hey there friends of SpanishPod101.com My name is Efraín And I'm Diego And today we're going to give you 10 expressions that Mexican use every day Nice Yeah, pretty nice, so Enjoy this video Woo! So, whereas in Mexico, you might want to blend right in the culture. And for that purpose, in this video, we will show you some expressions that we as Mexicans use basically every day. It wouldn't be strange to hear this in the streets or if you speak to a Mexican guy. Um, so, let's start with the first one. Okay, the first one is a poco. A poco. Really? A poco, really? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you translate it this, if you translate this directly, it could mean a little. <laughs> but uh, its meaning is really or don't you say. Mm. Uh -huh. For example, Diego, ya tengo trabajo. ¿A poco? Sí. Felicidades. En... Muchas gracias. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next one is chido or padre, which is in this case uh, the same word. And you can combine these words with uh, the verb estar, yeah. like está chido or está padre. So, chido or padre means cool. Okay, so está chido, like it's cool, está padre, it's cool. Mm -hmm. Or for example, Efraín es chido, he's cool, or obviously Diego es chido, like yeah. Diego is cool, okay? <laughs> Very good, so chido or padre, which means cool. Mm -hmm. For example, eh, Efraín, ¿viste la última película de Batman? Ah, uh, no. No, oh, está bien chida. ¿En serio? Or, está bien padre, sí, vamos a verla, es muy buena. Vamos a verla. The next one is a huevo, okay? And this expression has nothing to do with eggs, <laughs> no. <laughs> but it means hell yeah, okay, mm -hmm. well, it's, uh, the closest translation is hell yeah, yeah, okay, a Good. huevo, um, for example, la otra vez les gané a todos en el concurso de comer más hamburguesas, a huevo, okay. Ok, well, ok, a huevo. <risa> sí, a huevo. <risa> bueno, eran hamburguesas de... Chiquitas, sí, mini, sí, sí. mini hamburguesas. No, no, no. <risa> a huevo. Ok, guys, so the next word, or the next expression actually is que pedo or que onda. If you translate this literally, uh, you can translate it as what fart or what wave. But of course, it doesn't make any sense in English. So what we try to convey with this expression is just saying what's up. 
WhatsApp. Yeah, exactly. What's up? If you say, ¿qué pedo? Or, ¿qué onda? It means what's up. Be careful because this is informal. Try to use, try to stick with ¿qué onda? Which is more uh, informal for maybe an acquaintance, not really for a close friend. If you have a close friend, yes, you can start by saying ¿qué pedo? Like, for example, with Efraín, I will normally say ¿qué pedo? But from time to time, I use ¿qué onda? Which are the two most common greetings in mm -hmm. Mexico. And also, you can describe someone by saying that he is buen pedo or that he is buena onda, yeah. which is mean that he's he's nice, mm -hmm. he's good. For example, hey, ¿qué onda, Efraín? ¿Cómo estás? Bien, todo bien. Oye, ¿tú conoces a Teo? Ah, Teo, es muy buen pedo. Sí, me lo encontré hace rato y estuvimos hablando, súper buena onda. Qué bien. Lo invitas a la fiesta. Por supuesto. <risa> Ok, the next, the next expression is que hueva. What a bummer, what a drag, I don't feel like it. Que hueva. I need to have anything to do with a female egg. No, it doesn't. Uh, no. Like hueva or huevo. Like that egg or what a egg. Yeah, no, no, like no, no. no. Ok, so, for example, no manches, tengo mucho trabajo. Oh. Que hueva. Sí, que hueva. Pero tra estás trabajando ahora. <risa> ¡Qué hueva! ¡Qué hueva! Por dos. <risa> ok, so, the next one is sale y vale or even we can use va que va. And these two expressions, sale y vale and va que va, means yeah, sure, ok, or even let's go. Uh -huh. For example, Efraín, tengo ganas de tomar un tequila. ¿Por qué no vamos a la cantina cuando terminemos este video? Va que va, sale y vale. Bien. Ok, the next one is neta. Or neta. Mm -hmm. And neta uh, could be translated as the third. But if it, if it is used as a question, it could be translated as really? Neta. Neta. For example, Diego, la neta me gusta Valeria. Mm. Ah, Valerie. <laughs> Te gusta mucho, se nota. <laughs> ok. Because <laughs> you have to say neta. Ah. Uh, ok, okay. what's again, what's again. <laughs> Diego, la neta, me gusta mucho Valerie. Mm, neta. Neta. <laughs> <laughs> ok. The next one is orale. And you might be familiar with this word because we actually made a video. So if you haven't watched that, uh, please go and uh, watch it because we give a full explanation on many ways to use this uh, simple expression, yeah. orally. But in a nutshell, it is for conveying approval or enthusiasm or even amazement. Okay? So, for example, like, orale, Efraín, me enteré que tienes un nuevo trabajo. Felicidades. Muchas gracias. <laughs> The next one is no hay bronca. Okay, let's focus first on bronca. Bronca is commonly used to refer to a problem or to a discomfort. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no hay bronca, no hay bronca, as you can imagine, <laughs> means there is no problem. Mm -hmm. Everything's fine. Okay, there are no hay bronca. Um, exactly, like, like for example, mm -hmm. eh, Efraín, anoche me besé a tu novia, Karina. No hay bronca, amigo. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> no hay bronca, ¿verdad? <laughs> okay. So, uh, the last one is one that is very handy and that's algo así como. Algo así como is very similar to kind of in English. So, you might use this one to clarify or to explain something. Uh, for example. Um, Diego... ¿Qué significa no manches? No manches, no manches es algo así como decir en inglés, are you kidding? No manches, ¿te besaste a Karina? No, es, es broma, no, es, dijiste que no hay bronca. That's it for today, my beautiful friends from SpanishBall101.com. We hope that you have enjoyed this video. If so, please give us your thumbs up and share with other learners who also want to know some expressions that we Mexicans use every day. 
And also, don't forget to comment or give us your opinion in the comment section down yeah. below because we will be reading them and replying to them, of yeah. course. It's a tune for our upcoming video here at SpanishPod101.com and see you soon, guys. Hasta luego. Want to speed up your language learning? Take your very first lesson with us. You'll start speaking in minutes and master real conversations. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Just click the link in the description.